You guys always tell me, Clarence, we like our fast facts. So you do have 2018-19 Grand Blank fast facts, and you'll see that on the screen in a moment. It'll tell you everything from our budget um, down to our demographics, percentage of kids that go to college, all of those things. Uh, these are good because when you're out, if you're a business owner or you are um, a community member and people are asking you questions about the school, um, these are good to have handy and say, well, let me, let me tell you about that. I, I can let you know exactly how these kids are free to this lunch and grab like. It's, it's right here on my card. Also, you do have another fast fact one for our sinking fund, and we'll talk about that today as well. May 7th will be the election for the renewal, key word, renewal of our sinking fund. And again, we'll talk about that, but some fast facts about that, what it can be used for and what it can't be used for. And then really, based on a suggestion you had, I don't know if it was a good one, but it was a suggestion, and we took it. You asked us to put some communication cards together. So you have a tri-fold card, and you'll see it does have phone numbers on the back of it. But if you open it, this is good if you're talking to somebody and they say, for example, you know, I talked to the bus driver about a bus situation, but... I really, I, I wasn't happy with that answer or satisfied with what they had to say. Who do I talk to next? I don't know who to call next. Well, if you look at this, it'll say, call the transportation director. So this is kind of a, um, it's a card to kind of help you if you're wondering who I call if I have a question about something. Or, you know what would be nice? Even people calling to thank somebody for doing something. We rarely do that anymore. So anyways, this came from you guys, from this group. So you have that card as well. And then the two kind of folded brochures that you have. Remember, the future is now. That's a campaign that, thanks to our Board of Education, the vision that they had to secure our financial future over the next three years, that lays out what that plan is. Thanks to you and your support last year, you helped get our uh, non-homestead millage renewed, and that's why you see past on there. And then, of course, in 2019, we're gonna be going for a sinking fund, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then in 2020, uh, this is going to be a real big one here. We're looking at something called a zero increase bond. What that means is we do not increase your taxes. We just um, push our millages or mills out for a few years. It allows us to generate a lot of money, and we'll talk about what that money will be used there for. Excuse me, everything from athletics to renovation of classrooms, bathrooms, security systems, all of that. And then finally, Dr. Walbert's going to talk... Uh, a little bit, I know you have, this is really exciting. This is our strategic plan, and for the teachers that are in the room, you know we've had this for a long time. This was really shelved for a little bit due to financial reasons. <coughs> our board again, with their vision and wisdom, said we got to crank this up again. Let's get our strategic plan started again. What you'll hear us say in Grand Blank when we go to make decisions about things, the one question we will ask always is where does that fit in our strategic plan? So if it's not in our plan, it's uh, then why are we really doing it? So this is really kind of our roadmap, and this is some highlights of that. So, all right, so let's go ahead and see what's been happening. Thanks, Dr. Albert. Okay, from July 1st through October 24th, well, we've had about 117 days, lots of hours, almost 3,000 in lots of minutes. And I was telling the morning group, and I look good, too. <laughs> I mean, the start of the year, I was looking sharp. So here's what's happened uh, since the start of the school year that we're very proud of. Um, we have begun year two of implementing the Positivity Project. I told the morning group, I do not like green and white. I'm a Wolverine through and through. But if you see those green and white shirts out there, those are the Positivity shirts. You can see the, the emblem there on the top right. We are the only K-12 system in the country, kindergarten through 12th grade, currently that um, are implementing this particular character education program very excited about it. And in a nutshell, um, it's really about, we use a hashtag called hashtag other people matter. It's really about giving back and seeing worth and value in others through your own strength. So very excited that we're doing that. Hired over 70 staff members. Crazy, right? And uh, people, geez, is that normal? What's, actually, that's pretty normal. We average anywhere from the 70s to the 80s each year in terms of new staff members. Those are not all teachers. About 40 plus of those are teachers and the rest are in other departments. We recognize four National Merit semifinalists at our high school this year. You can kind of see the pictures up there with our high school principal, Mr. Frey. So those are uh, very excited for those four young people. And then we have begun our third year of a district-wide attendance initiative called Hashtag School Every Day. You might see that on the marquee when you drive by. <laughs> attendance in school, not Grand Blank, uh, well, Grand Blank maybe, uh, but really throughout Michigan, throughout the United States, um, Attendance is an issue. You have a lot of kids that miss a lot of school. Here in Grand Blank, 
we were looking at about 10% of our population that might miss 20 days of school or more. That's, that's, that's a lot of school. So we started this initiative three years ago, and we're actually seeing a change in our attendance here in Grand Lake. We average anywhere from 90 to 95 percent, depending on the school attendance at school every day, which is where we need them to be if we want to help. We uh, this year we have officially rolled out. This is good bad, especially depending on where you're at generationally. Some people are like Chromebooks. Why do we have all this technology? Well, this is the generation we're living in. Technology is what's driving um, things moving forward. You can see that we've rolled out 6,513 Chromebooks, third through 12th grade. So almost 7,000 devices. We had our financial audit that just took place Monday. We had the firm Lewis and Knopf came in and shared with our Board of Education how we're doing financially. And I'm very excited to announce we had no findings, which of course is always good. And you'll see in a slide later. This will be the first time in about Five years, Todd? Uh, four years. Four years, okay, thank you. In four years that we have not borrowed money from the state of Michigan to meet our payroll in August and September. Remember, as a school district, not just unique to Grand Blanc, it's uh, throughout the state of Michigan, you actually don't get your first state aid note, it's called, from uh, the state of Michigan until October. Well, you guys know when school starts, our staff's back in late August and the kids are there in September. We have to pay people, they're working. Um, but you're not going to get any money from the state of Michigan until October. So what we have had to do in the past is we've had to borrow. We've had to borrow. If you had a good delivery, bring him in. <laughs> we've had to borrow money to make payroll. And this will be the first year, as Todd said, in four years that we have not, we will not be doing that. We have enough cash reserve to meet our payroll demands. And I think uh, board members are here this evening or this afternoon. I think uh, Christy, our presenter, said, you broke the cycle, which I think is very tough to do once you get in that borrowing cycle. So congratulations to our board for helping with that. Um, staff supplied open 13 buildings, 8,268 kids. A lot of kids, which is good news. Clear, you know, how did that compare to past years? Yeah, you know what, Keith, I'll show you. We're up, which is good news. Yeah, enrollment's up, and, I, and in another slide, I'll show you exactly how many. Good, good question. Um, we hosted our annual homecoming activities. I was able to emcee the alumni dinner. We had three alums go in. Um, Lou Blessing went in, if you knew Lou. Uh, he went in. Mike Williams, who is the, uh, the head basketball coach at Beecher, he um, went in as well, so we had, a, we had a great group. And Sue, you actually opened up something new, the Alumni Alley. And do you want to say anything about Alumni Alley? Well, we're trying to um, give an opportunity for our alumni to come back to Grand Blanc. Um, we hear lots of stories on how the kids enjoy being here and, and going to school here, but you know, my kids, they come back for homecoming and they go, now what do we do? So we're looking at having an area um, during the homecoming game for the alumni to come back and reconnect. So we had a good first year this year and already have plans for make it bigger and better next year. So we'll look for that next year. Thank you for that. And then um, we hired a new West Middle School principal. I put that up there because I, I want that. I hope you can make a connection. His name is Ross Burdett. Uh, now, the people here are here this morning, you can't answer. Do you know the connection? Who Ross is? His father actually works in our community. The fire, the fire chief, right? Chief Burdett. This is Chief Burdett's son. He has come back. He's a Grand Blanc grad. His wife and him both are Grand Blanc grads. And uh, we took him from the Troy School District, and he's now an assistant principal for us at West Mill School. So we did bring one of our grads home, so we're excited about that. We also, Amber mentioned, we're beginning our second year here at the Perry Innovation Center. We now have second through seventh grade, last year second through sixth grade, so we've added uh, here. Um, probably, probably the place in terms of when we look at technology and the impact that technology has on learning and how teachers use that and how students interact with technology, this is the place really where we're kind of experimenting with a lot of that technology. And um, Amber's class, as a matter of fact, are some of the kids who were school presented to our board Monday night. And um, our board was very impressed with the things they're doing with technology. So great, great job. Uh, we talked about, we introduced our new strategic plan, some of those action plans. Dr. Albert, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, it's uh, been an exciting time. Last year, the crux of my work was to take the whole scope of the year and revamp our strategic plan. It was a, a huge undertaking. And I want to commend, uh, we have about 100 people across our district take part in that. Um, we developed five strategies and 22 action plans that are kind of outlined in summary in that brochure. 
Um, we have a lot of momentum going this year. A lot of those action plans are, are taking place. Um, we hired staff this year. We've had training, which you see in restorative practices, that all is in line with our strategic plan. So it goes not only from instruction to the physical spaces that we use to our, um, our athletic facilities and upgrades to our technology and infrastructure. Um, it's all it's all encompassing, and we're excited about the future. So if you really want to see this in more detail, on our website, on the home page, there's a narrated video right in the middle. All you do is click play, and I walk you through step by step all of the great things that came out of our strategic planning process last year, and um, some of the great things that are happening this year. Or if you just like to hear his voice, click it. And, uh, you'll get to hear it for about seven minutes. Actually, you do an excellent job narrating. Thank you. Uh, this was huge, and you're going to see how this plays out. Uh, in the future, in just a moment, but it says transformed our libraries at Anderson, Cook, and Indian Hill to create flexible learning spaces and what we call maker space. It's hard to see in those pictures. We're going to show you some more in just a moment. If you've been to Indian Hill, though, or you've been to Cook um, or to Anderson, libraries are changing. Remember, they used to be filled with books, right? And you'd go in the library, and if you take out a book, you'd slap your hand or whatever, right? Because you're supposed to put it back and lots of rules and crazy stuff. Not bad. It was just that time. You're going to see libraries are changing. They're becoming these flexible spaces. If you have grandchildren or kids, I guess for that matter, and they come over to visit, you know they're not big on sitting still. Right. Um, they like to roll around. They like to lay upside down, kind of do different things. Not that there's chaos or jungle that's going on out there. All I mean is we have to adapt. As a school system, part of your responsibility is if your learners are changing, you have to change as well to meet those needs, and that's really what uh, we're doing with these new libraries. So you'll see some pictures in a moment. Dr. Allward mentioned, I said it's cut off a little bit there, but uh, we have begun to implement restorative practices. When I was in school, and probably for a lot of you as well, if I got in trouble, in essence, they opened the book and they said, you said a bad <laughs> word, and, okay, you get a day's suspension. There was really no discussion about it. It was like, that's what you did, and here's what you get. Well, the state of Michigan has taken a close look at this and said, you know, these zero tolerance policies that you have, maybe there's a better way to deal with some of the infractions that are not major infractions and restorative practices is really about bringing kids together that do things that they shouldn't have done to other kids sometimes to themselves and bringing experts together meaning teachers counselors <coughs> advisors to talk about those things to see if there's a way short of suspending a kid that you can address that issue it works in some cases it's not going to work at all now, it doesn't mean if a student brings a weapon to school, we're going to sit down and let's talk about why you did it. There are going to be some things that are non-negotiable things. But this is a, a different philosophical practice for us in education, and I do think it's, it's going to pay huge dividends moving forward. And then you heard me say we did not have to borrow to be payroll, which is great. Keith, you asked this question, so you can see 8,268 students. We added 36 students from last fall's count. It's good news for us. It means we're trending in the right direction. I am very conservative. I think uh, Mrs. Anderson, I know, appreciates my conservatism. Um, we budgeted for 50 fewer students this year. So we're up 36. You can do the quick math. That means 86 to the positive for us when we look at ourselves financially, which is wonderful. Uh, we only get 90% of our money from the state of Michigan based on our fall count. So you actually you don't get all your money. We're going to get 90%. Um, and this year we got a little bump. Todd, I think you told me $210? Uh, yep. yep. Okay. So you can see our foundational allowance. What that means when you see that, if you're new to this, that means for every student that comes in the door, we get $7,976. And that's, that's how we're funded. So, and that's a bump. Well, we were about $7,700 last year. That's from the state? That's from the state, yes. Yeah, from the state of Michigan. <clears throat> Uh, and you have your cards, your fast facts in front of you. Um, you can see, we think of Grand Blank, we're this small kind of bedroom community. We know the owner of Great Harvest, right? And we, we, we know the Lutherans and the Methodists are trying to work things out. <laughs> so we're, we're a small community, but the truth is we're a large business. We're large. If you look at our budget, we're an $80 million organization. Huge. People don't think about that in schools. They think about grades and attendance and teachers. This is, there's a business here too, very large one. Um, you know about our foundation allowance. Percent college bound, 85% have indicated that they are college bound. And this is our free and reduced lunch. You can see it says 30%. That's as of October of this year. So that means we have 30% of the kids that attend Grand Lake schools, their families have filled out an application and they are eligible for free 
or reduced launch. So, um, and how does that rate clearance, that percentage actually is a little bit lower um, than what you will find that happens in January, February, and in May. The number will actually go up as the school year goes on. So, almost one in every three in Grand Blanc. All right, so let me give you some updates. You guys, a few years ago, went to the polls and you said, you know what? We know technology is coming, we know the kids need it, we know the schools need it, and you supported a $32 million bond for our district. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Series one of that bond has already been allocated and spent. Renovations, various things, Chromebooks, right? Well, we're now in series two, which is just over $11 million last year, and I think about $11.4, $11.5 million. And here are the things we're doing with that. You can see at Anderson Cook, Indio Hill, McGrath, over our 100 classrooms, actually 107 classrooms, this is what they've received. New wall-mounted projectors, sound systems, adjustable teacher desk, whiteboards, I don't even know what a digital video switch is, but I know it's important. <laughs> um, the adjustable desk, I will tell you, this is kind of a big thing because um, it allows the teacher, instead of uh, sitting at the desk while they're doing things, you can actually stand now, better for your health. Um, so that's why we got those for our teachers. Um, our classrooms also received all new electrical and data wiring um, so that it can meet today's technology standards. So a lot happening there. This is gonna be hard to see and I apologize. I know that's a long ways away, but I just wanted you to get a look at kind of what's going on in some of these rooms. Um, down here at the bottom, you're gonna see these things that looks like this wall has chicken pox kind of, <laughs> right? What that is is um, when they go to take these boards off the walls, remember they have chalkboards up there in some cases, whiteboards in some cases that have to come off, those are adhered to the wall with liquid nail. So that's what you're seeing there. And what they have to do in some cases is go and grind all of that down so that they can put a new, a new uh, board up. I'm showing that to tell you sometimes they think, ah, just, just renovate the room. It can't be that hard. It's amazing the work that they have to do to transform some of these locations. So you see some of that work happening there. <clears throat> devices. You can see here devices. So what are they taking home? We are now um, when one to one, as you know, it's actually you're going to see three through twelve. But at grades three through five, we have one thousand eight hundred new devices that we put in their hands, which we know sometimes is good, sometimes you know not so good for some kids. But that's what we rolled out to our students. We have iPad carts. Those are in every kindergarten classroom. So we have iPad cards, and then we have what's called Chromebook touch screens. We have two of those in each one of our rooms. And then you can kind of see down towards the bottom, we are now two to one. What that means is two students to every one device at um, kindergarten through second grade. So you can see the future. You can see what's dominating learning today. It really is technology. Um, that's, that's kind of where we're headed. Not where we're headed, it's where we're at. So again, just a picture of devices, 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 that top left, those are part of those 1,800 Chromebooks uh, that they were unboxing and putting into cases for the students. There's the crew in the middle, they're smiling. They probably weren't smiling after they had unboxed and do all of those. <laughs> we caught them at a good moment. All right, so what's happening with our updates in technology? I mentioned to you that Anderson, Cook, and Indian Hill, we expanded and renovated their spaces and their libraries. Next summer, so this upcoming summer, you will see if you have kids or you're familiar with Brindle, Myers, and Reed, we will be expanding and renovating their libraries as well. And then 2020, middle schools and the high school will undergo major changes. So lots, lots happening. So there's the new Anderson one. And a couple things, it's, it's kind of interesting, it's hard to see, and I know there's a lot of pictures there. I'll tell you the most favorite, or the favorite spot for the kids, and you would probably guess it too. It's hard to see, but See these chairs? These are kind of these, these half moon chairs. These little cubbies here, you'll see a picture of them. Kids love those. And uh, what we're finding today, again, is kids, um, kids, some of them like some privacy. They like to be in the little cubby and almost confined. And then there are other kids that like to be out in a more open space as they're reading or working. You can see some kids there reading, right? And kind of pairing up, and you can see the furniture that they're using. Notice the color, too. Remember how our schools, even as we look at this room, it used to be very mundane, right? Almost uh, institutionalized, like a hospital almost. JP and his crew working very hard to bring color now into our learning spaces. Very nice. That's Indian Hill, Sarah, your old building, right? Your old place, Sarah. Great spot here. It's again hard to see, I apologize. 
If you go way over here, Sarah, that's your aquarium that was outside, right? Mm -hmm. Or not aquarium, pond, I should say, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think there are fish in there, so that's all integrated into that space. So kids can feed the fish and they can go outside. Um, you have a whole wall of windows now, too, which is, is wonderful. And that pond was a, Whoops. Was a um, Eagle Scout project. Oh, so an Eagle Scout did your pond there. <laughs> wonderful. Great space. All right, so here's the future. This is what's, if you're familiar with Reed Elementary, notice how big that is. So what you're going to see coming in the future is you're going to see, again, libraries used to have all these shelves, all these books and things. You're going to see that very, it, it changes a lot. So you'll notice the space is wide open. The blue that you see, that's chairs uh, that the kids could set and movable, and all of that furniture is movable. So that's one configuration, but you can move that in various configurations, so very flexible for our kids. There's Myers. So I knew we had some Myers people here today who said um, that their kids have gone to Myers. Anybody notice something that's absolutely missing from these pictures, though, that you might have seen in these pictures just two or three years ago? Books. Books, yeah. yeah. That has changed. There are fewer books. That's true. Yes. Yep, desks are gone. They used to be in libraries. The other thing is in most of these spaces, you used to have a computer lab. Most of the libraries have computer labs either attached to them or right in them. They're gone. Why are they gone? Because now you have a Chromebook and it's flexible. You move. It goes where you go. You don't go where the lab is. So uh, quite a change. There's Brindle Elementary. I think I did that picture a little sideways, so I apologize, but you can kind of see the open space there on the top part. Again, why are they different too, Clarence? Why are all the designs different? The designs are different based on bringing, one, the footprint of the building, right, the footprint of that library, but also bringing the kids and the people in that building in and saying, help us design this. What should this look like for you? So they were, their input was important. And then there's Mason. If you've been out to Mason, you know the library has this big glass area towards the top, <laughs> a couple wings off of it, so you'll see how that's going to change. So very, very exciting stuff happening. All right, so let's get to why you really came, but we wanted you to see how your money is being used, right? You need to know, this is, Clarence, when we have $11 million, how are they using that money? How's it making a difference for our kids? Um, as I said, it's been a slow, a slow start to the school year in terms of media. We've been calling, they don't answer. You know, we wanted to come out and run news stories on us. Um, obviously, I'm being facetious because it seems like any time if we stub our toe and grab blank, it's like, we're here with the cameras, let's get a shot. And it's, uh, that goes with the territory. Community protest. Um, as you know, we had a group that uh, got a hold of our city police chief, Chief White, and they said they were coming to Grand Blank and they were going to protest for a lot of different reasons. One was um, you had a transgender student on your homecoming court. Obviously, that's immoral and blah, blah, blah. Um, we heard that you had a girl on your football team. What are you thinking? Girls don't play football. Um, and lots of other reasons. There were other reasons as well. But some, the question I get asked the most about the community protest is this. They say, Clarence, why did you allow him to come here? Well, I want to clear the record on that. Um, and those of you that know me, I don't know this well. I didn't allow them to come here. I would have never allowed them to, uh, to come on our campus. I don't have a right, though, uh, to refuse them. So how this actually came about, if you don't know the story, is they actually wrote a letter to Chief Light. And they said, uh, Chief Light, you're the city Chile, or police chief here in Grand Blanc. We are coming to Grand Blanc, and we picked our location, Grand Blanc High School, and we're going to be there from 1020 to 1050. And you have a right as the police chief, not a right, I'm sorry, responsibility as the police chief to protect us under the First Amendment of the Constitution. So not an option, Chief. We're coming. Here's our time. Your job is to make sure we're safe, that nobody beats us up, nobody, no craziness happens. Now, I do feel a little bad for uh, Pastor Bearman because they decided to change their location. We didn't change it. They changed it. Wrong denied. So they did change it. They weren't on the church's property, but they were on that egress there, I think, by the, by the Lutheran Church. And I have to tell you, Todd is amazing. Uh, when we found out what was happening, we went to meet with Todd, and uh, Trevor and I both went over there. And um, I think the first thing he said to us was, um, well, you will have my full support and uh, the support of my congregation that will stand up against this. So Todd, I, I truly appreciate that. Um, what really happened? Uh, the truth is there were only six of them, I think, from Westboro that showed up. Chief uh, Light this morning said about three to 400 anti-protesters came in support of our community and, um, and our students and our staff and the people that live here. 
Um, there were about 50 police officers there. I think the sad part is the resources that had to be allocated to keep people safe. Was anybody there that day? Oh, look at the hands. Thank you, thank you, and thank you again. Um, there was so much support that we had in our community from our clergy and not just uh, Pastor Berman, but so many others as well. Um, and community members that showed up to say, not here, not here, uh, take it someplace else. So thank you to all of you that were there and supported. Any questions about that, I guess, before I... Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Jer. The group from Topeka. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> we, we've driven by there. Oh, you have. They protest all the time. Yeah. It's six usually what... Is that usually what they have? Yeah, some of you have done your research, I think, on this group. In essence, it's a family that, yeah, that kind of is. started this, yeah. right? Twelve of them are attorneys. Twelve are yeah. attorneys, that's correct. And they protested to be all. Oh, They're really looking for you to um, incite them and right. do some harm right. so that they can sue you. That's what they're right. looking for. The that's all they're funding, right? That's their business model. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the interesting thing was when they went into their van, they had these big uh, zipper pouches like you see in an art room. And they went through and they pulled out the certain signs that they wanted. So yeah. depending on how bad or ugly they wanted to be, they pulled out the signs, handed them out to their yeah. people, and went out there. Yeah. Just depending on where they were. It was very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the easy thing for us would have been to just close school. And uh, But here's what I, I guess I want you to know, good, bad, and whether you like me or not, um, is, you know, I don't want somebody else to dictate how we're going to do things in our community. And I yeah. never want to be a, a victim of, of somebody else's... Um, pushing their agenda upon us. Our kids had a right to be at school on that day. Um, it was their class games. It was the Friday of homecoming. They were competing. Um, no, we're not going to yield to something like that. Um, I know some places closed and they changed, but we're not going to. Now, that being said, do I wake up now and at night thinking about safety all the time? Absolutely. I would not have done it if I thought they were at risk, and I want you to know that. Um, I would not. Um, I didn't believe we were, and we certainly helped uh, support that. Now, we did do something a little tricky to the kids. Don't go home and tell your kids this if you got high school kids. Um, we delayed them leaving on yes. purpose. They didn't know that because they were competing in games uh, for class games to see who's going to win freshman, sophomore, junior, seniors. Um, so by the time our high school kids actually exited the high school on that Friday, uh, the Westboro group was gone. They were already gone and on the expressway. So um, know this, behind the scenes, yeah, there are things that are always going to go on that I can't always tell you, um, but safety will always be the priority. That will never be compromised for our kids. Um, new strategic plan, Dr. Orr, you talked about that. Is there anything else you want to add? Um, I don't think so. Are there any questions that anyone might have on that, on the strategic plan? Like I said, it's an exciting time. It's kind of our blueprint for, for the future, and um, <coughs> we're just exciting to continue to implement it because we haven't had an opportunity to do that in a while. Sinking Fund Renewal, we talked a little bit about that, but that's coming up. You'll hear more about that May 7th. Again, our board is to be commended. They really gave me lots of charges, but the one charge was financial stability. Stabilize this clearance moving forward. Make sure that this can go on long after we're here as board members, long after you're here as a superintendent. That's why this is year two of a three-year plan to stabilize that. Last year you approved the non-homestead, you approved that for 10 years. That's huge for us, huge for us. Sinking fund, oh, quick question, I should have a prize for this. Sinking fund, uh, you're excited about it. Does any, JP, you can't answer this. Does anyone know when you started the sinking fund in Grand Blanc? Oh my, oh wait. Uh, Mary, get a prize, right? Uh, oh, oh wait, I'm getting, okay. Because Donna, go ahead. I was on, I was on the, the committee yeah. that, that did that. What okay, that's year? not a year. I can't tell you. Well, she was on the committee. Roger, you're right. 72 or 3? 75. 1975. Here's what's crazy. You guys need to be so proud of your community. 1975, you said that we need a sinking fund. Now, remember, a sinking fund is to pay for operational things. You can't pay salaries. You can't pay health insurance. None of that stuff. But you can do parking lots. You can do roofs, right? You can do windows. And if you drove by this summer, I hope you did, you might have saw a sign out in the yard that says, funded by the sinking fund, right? Or project being done by the sinking fund. It's to let you know this is how your money is being used. So that parking lot out here that was done, sinking fund. Parking lot over here, sinking fund. Yep, the part of the library, some of that stuff that's going on, part of that um, might include some sinking fund money. So 1975, and here's the crazy thing that you also did. You renewed that every five years for 40 plus years. 
Why is that important, Clarence? I told the, the morning group, I got a call a couple days ago from the superintendent of Goodrich. His name is uh, Brian Ralphin, Mr. Ralphin, nice, nice young guy. And uh, he wanted to talk to JP. And he said, I want to talk to JP about operations and how we, you know, how we get some things funded and da da da. And I said, well, you know, he talked to me about a couple projects. And I said, so how are you paying, bless you, how are you paying for that project? And he said, I have to use my general fund. And I said, well, just take it out of your sinking fund. It's, it's an allowable expense. He said, we don't have one, Goodrich. Yeah. So when I say to you it's unique what you did 40 plus years ago, I'm not making that up. There are communities that don't have that. So yes, if you have a roof that needs to be fixed and you don't have that, you're going to have to take it out of your general fund. And that means something else is going to have to give. So we'll get you more information. Um, it is a renewal, not a new tax. Um, but on May 7th of 2019, we'll actually be going to the polls for that. Can I add one thing to you that? You sure can, Don. Yeah. I think that's one of the best things at Grand Blank schools every day at the people in the community because we keep everything up mm -hmm. to date. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and we don't have too many potholes or stuff like that. Where other places you just see it decline. Yeah. That's it, Don, you just said, and that's what happens. Because they don't have the money. At the end of the day, you're gonna have to make decisions. Do we pay our people? Uh, do we fix this? I mean, it's coming out of your general fund, right? And that's why that is so, so important for us to have it. So thank you, Nikki, for saying that. Um, we talked. To, we didn't talk about this lunch procedure changes. And I'm not going to go into a, a lot about this. There was somebody in the morning group that said, "Clarence, I heard that you were on WWJR Sunday." It is true. Um, talking about lunch changes in Grand Blanc, um, and I was on there because there is a bill right now in the state of Michigan. Uh, Senator Ananek is uh, sponsoring the bill, and it's a bill that will use a phrase called food or yeah, food shaving. And in essence, what that means is um, maybe a student who doesn't have enough money to pay for their food. The lunch that they want, that lunch is taken away from them. And they have to get an alternative lunch. Well, the truth is, every school district in the state of Michigan has some policy like that. It's not unique to Grand Blanc. Our policy was a little strict, some might say. I will tell you, it was pretty normalized, though. Um, but we've made some major changes um, here in Grand Blanc. And the biggest change we've made is how we communicate with parents, letting them know that their children's lunch accounts are low. And that's the biggest thing we struggle with is you're all very responsible parents, but we do have a segment where we have to really um, reach out to them and make sure that they're putting money in their child's account. And if they don't have money in their account, guess what they can do? If they don't have money, you can apply for free and reduced lunch. We can help you with that. But we were struggling with that. So one of the biggest changes we made is now um, it used to be if you don't have your money, you go through the lunch line, you were getting an alternative lunch. Well, we've changed that now that actually we're allowing you to go through there four times, so actually four lunches, it's actually a dollar amount. Um, but all along, while all of that's happening, we're contacting mom and dad, we're sending mom and dad emails, we're sending them text messages to hopefully help with that, that issue. So um, if you see anything about that, in my opinion, the media made that much more than what it was in our school district. Um, but we're the biggest, so we're gonna get the attention. Student enrollment trends, we talked about that, but we did roll out something new this year. We are now online. That was okay. Um, what that means, and if we're parents here, you're probably going, yeah, I know it was okay. Um, everything now is online. So if you want to enroll your child in Grand Lake Community Schools, it's all done electronically. It used to be paper, right? And we still allow some to do paper as we're kind of working through a system, but predominantly online. The reason is convenience for them. Um, you can be at home, you can be on your cell phone, and you can enroll your child in the school. So you can update your information now online. You don't have to call the office or send us a form. And so here was our mistake. I'll just admit one. Um, <laughs> we tried to do that with 8,268 families, right? All at one time, crazy. Um, so in hindsight, you know that old saying, start small, think big? Uh, we thought big and started big. And um, so we, there were some lessons learned there for sure. Ally Challenge, did a lot of you go to the golf tournament? Yeah, Jerry, okay, not a lot of you, but one, good Jerry. <laughs> he was there as well. Um, that was exciting, they had professional golf back in Grand Blanc, very exciting. Uh, Chris Kaufman, the tournament director, worked closely with our school district uh, to make sure that we had the things in place we needed. Our Grand Blanc Athletic Foundation helped with parking, right? And we had that Friday off for what we call a community day. Well, the plan always was what? Next year the tournament was moving to August, August, right? We all remember that. And then the year after that, it was moving to August. Well, the plans change. After they talked to the tournament players, they talked to Warwick, talked to folks in our community, business owners, they thought that time of year was very good. 
So they actually just changed the dates. It will be in September uh, next year. You can see the 9th through the 15th, which means we will be having another community day <laughs> on that Friday. Uh, why? The reason we're in that community day is we park vehicles. And parking vehicles, obviously, we generate some money from that, and that allows us to put that money towards things uh, like we're going to be turfing our high school West Gym and, and different projects like that. So there was a good question this morning, though. Someone said, Clarence, how much money did we raise? What did we, what did we get on that? And then how much did we used to raise in the Buick Open? JP had some numbers for me. He's our historian. When we had the Buick Open here years ago, parking would raise forty to $60,000. Huge, right? We didn't have to do fundraising, by and large, especially at our high school, because you had all that money. The Ally Challenge raised $12,500. So, still good, we'll take it. You never say no to money, right? We'll take it. Uh, but not nowhere near what the Buick Open used to do. And as a matter of fact, we actually, with parking cars, collecting $5 from each car, what we brought in this year was just over $7,700. The Ally Challenge, though, had guaranteed us $12,500, so they made up the difference. Yeah. So every year, we will get $12,500, regardless of how many cars we park. Right now, um, I want to open this up for a moment before I close. Uh, there's one thing I want to show you in, as part of closing, but um, I want to know, are there any questions from you or things that you hear in the community that you thought, I'm going to this meeting and now would be a good time to ask that, that question? Don't all raise your hand at once. <laughs> all right, let's, Sarah, let's start with you. I just wondered about the PESG, but that's in the news that, and that's what we use our substitute teachers. I did hear the district changed from them yeah. last year. Is that affecting anything? Not for us. Sarah asked a good question. Um, with our substitute teachers, we contract with a company called Edge Staff. Actually, if you walk out, you'll probably see an Edge Staff sign up there. Up until last March, or I think it was March, March, we worked with a company called PESG. And if you've seen the news recently, they were a big substitute company, contracted company, and they closed their doors unexpectedly Monday night, right? So 110 school districts in Michigan arrived at work on Tuesday, and guess what they didn't have? No subs. No subs. Now, if you know about the Dearborn School District, some of the neighborhood of 20, 30,000 kids, big yeah. school district, no subs. Now, I'm going to just attribute it to my, my great knowledge and wisdom that we switched <laughs> last year. It wasn't. Um, we had taken a look at the company, though. We knew the company was struggling financially. A year ago, we decided to get out of that business as a county. So in Genesee County, all of the 21 districts removed ourselves from PSG last March and went with a company called Edgestan. Okay, so that did not impact us. Um, now, there are some county school districts, though, that still use PSG for like para-pro subs, coaches, and that's something that they will, will have to deal with. So Edge staff right now is the biggest player in the game. Good question. I'm sorry, Jerry? Now, for JP, I see the sign yeah. over by the baseball diamond. Yeah. Yes. But what are they doing in, on the diamond? Go ahead, Jason. So we're replacing the bag stop. Um, we, we, had issue, we, have, we have some safety issues. You know, what was happening, you get a lot of foul balls that go over. And last year we had two cars that were hit. One was a high school girl who was a, a soccer player, one was an adult. And I was almost the third guy, except I accelerated and the thing hit me just behind my car. So, <laughs> so what we're going to do is put up a net backstop, which is going to go up 40 feet in the air, and it's going to be the three, you know, two wings and, and the backstop. Then we're going to put chain link fence in front of the dugout so that foul balls won't go in and, and hit the players when they're in the dugout. Um, but it's, we're putting a concrete slab, and then we're going to build a knee wall, and then put this this uh, forty foot thing up on top of the knee wall, basically. So that's prim that's primarily the, the short story on what's going on. Here. But did you already know your hand was up. On that sinking fund, yeah, slide that you had, yes, allocate money, you know, for special projects. Yes. Is there any project that revives the football field? <laughs> Strategic. You know what? Don't tell him yet. Okay. <laughs> we got to get you on the committee. There is a plan. And Trevor just said it, Dr. Albert said it. It's in our strategic plan, and I'll tell you the key, and not to put pressure on you, I don't mean it this way, but in 2020, when we go for that zero bond increase, mm -hmm. you will see in our strategic plan, uh, Hugh, that includes total renovation of all of that. Even to um, include, now obviously we have to get our board approval and stuff like that, so I want to get hold of the board, but it's in the plan, it would include turf, it includes redoing those facilities, the concessions, yeah. the bathrooms, and the truth is this, guys, we're a class A high school, the largest in the county. 
Um, our, it's time to upgrade our facilities. It really yeah, is. Yeah, I mean, yeah. No disrespect yeah. to this school district because I'm sure they're <laughs> fine. But you know, when you see that Hamity, right? At least yeah. I know him as Hamity. You might know him as Westwood Heights. They open up a three million dollar athletic complex and they're a school of about seven hundred kids. That was this week. They yes, it was. Hugh, I was not happy. I, had, I should have called you. <laughs> <laughs> I was miserated. It was not good. But we're ready. It is time for us to do that. In, to your point, Hugh, it's in the plan. It is there. Um, we just got to make sure that we get our, our vote passed so that we can get those things done. Good question, Jerry. Sorry. And just uh, just a comment. You know, about the, the kid that painted the uh, baseball diamond, softball diamond, all that artwork was the Bobcat and stuff. Mm -hmm. He did a tremendous job. I yeah. look at that every time I drive by. It's yeah. just beautiful work. It really is. Yeah, you're exactly right. And that well, you're right. That was done by a student. You're exactly right. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Last year, we really enjoyed going through the Innovation Center. Oh, yeah. And yeah. we told our grandson, all our kids and grandkids have gone through this district. They live one block into Flint. And we said, you've got to move because oh. I would have loved to have taught in that. Yeah. And you've got to have it. So my question is, yeah. what is the percentage of kids that apply get to accept it? I'm glad I have Mrs. Hall here. Mrs. Hall, go ahead. Hey, it really depends on the grade level. There were a couple of grade levels this year that we could accept all of the students, but we had waiting lists for at least three, maybe four of our grade levels. We have six grade levels all together. So I would say we could, we probably had about 200 applicants and we were able to take in just over 100. So, so to your point, the graphics too. Yeah. And then yeah. parents have to bring them, or do they get bus too? Most of them are di uh, students that are in the district, right. and we do have a bus route. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We just brought all of them. See, I'm already thinking about a five-month-old. <laughs> Love it. Well, you do know somebody, so maybe that'll help, right? I saw some other hands. Yes, because you guys are rolling out the same information and techniques to the other schools. That would address that. Yeah, you know, I. Um, it's funny. Our expansion, the board, our board um, was very insightful on this as well. If you remember, we um, part of the reason we changed the focus here is because um, we had a we had a fire issue, right? We had young people that were on the second floor. You do there is a state law, fire law, that says you cannot have kids of that age on the second floor, right? So once we started looking at that, our board also challenged us with looking at how do we redesign this place. So that's where the innovation center came out of through that. And that's why you see it as second through seventh grade. Your question though is there, are you looking at expanding it? There's still stuff here. You have a huge early childhood program here. Um, and why is it here? It's centrally located. People can drop their little ones off and they can hit the expressway. So um, yes, we've had those discussions. As a matter of fact, we're gonna meet with Mrs. Hall, I even think later this week um, about looking at the future. What we have to think about if we do that, if we expand it, we talked about a waiting list and it grows and we open up classrooms, somebody's gonna be displaced though, right? You're gonna to have to move, the only way you can do that, because there is a third floor here, but I'm not gonna let JP get started on this. The third floor <laughs> is not inhabitable here, right? It, uh, it would take millions of dollars to renovate that thing. So we would have to move existing programs here to open that up. I went to junior high here probably 35 years ago, so. Were you on the third floor? Yeah. Yeah, they had a library there, right? Wow. Yeah, they, they claim those ghosts there, no, I don't know. <laughs> there would be some work to do if we opened up the third floor. Good there are question. No ghosts. So, oh, I don't know. So, <laughs> my, Go ahead. I'm sorry, my second question was regarding substitute teachers. Yeah. So, I have been hearing some grumbling that this district doesn't pay very well for substitute teachers and that they're losing substitutes to other districts. And so, I've heard somebody actually make a comment that they're really scraping the bottom of the barrel for substitutes in Grand Blanc. Is that, I mean, I'm, that's No, that's, that's a fair comment. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. I, it, it, that doesn't uh, bother me at all in terms of the fact that. Here's the deal. There aren't a lot of subs out there, period. Um, are we paying less? No. If you look at the scale, we're paying right along with the other districts, the Davisons, the Flushings, the Goodriches, um, the Fintons of the world. Who pays a little higher? And you're gonna know why they pay. Flint's gonna pay a little higher. Mount Morris is gonna pay, pay a little higher. No knock on those districts, but why are they gonna pay? If, if everybody's paying the same, and you have a choice to sub at Grand Blanc or Flint, where are you gonna sub? So remember, this is how economics works. So could we pay a little more? 
Absolutely, we can pay a little more. So when we pay a little more, what are the other? What does Flynn and Mount Morris do? Yeah. They pay a little more. So you can see how this goes. Um, have we? Are we in discussions daily about subs? Yes. Um, is there a shortage? Absolutely. Is our pay though? I think we're number two or three. I will tell you in terms of being the top paid subs. Uh, in our county, so we're we're not even close to the lowest. And we put a, know, so I can share that yes. right. for people who are we, saying something about We that. put an incentive program in place a couple years ago for our subs as well to increase our fill rates because there's you, you want to expand your pool, but you also want to increase your fill rates. And we have some great subs that sub all the time. If we can get some of our subs that sub five or ten days a month to sub thirteen to fourteen days a month, that makes a huge difference. So it's not always the volume of subs, it's how, how often do those subs um, come in and, and take advantage of that. So that incentive has helped a little have bit. Have you ever thought of have, having hiring teachers permanently and substitutes? Yes. There are some issues yes. with, the, with ORS, the retirement services, and their pensions. So we have had those discussions. It's a matter of the pay rate because we have to pay them as a grand blanket employee opposed to a subcontractor employee. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Jerry, sir? Uh, another question. I, last year, you mentioned that the high school is going to be building a house. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can you explain you know, where they're going to build a house, if it's on property? Yeah. A little more detail about that. You saw my face, sounds right? Like quite yeah. a huge project. Habitat for Humanity selected Grand Blank to build a house. They found property off of Reed Road over by um, Reed Elementary, as a matter of fact. Habitat pulled out of that project about three months ago, um, uh, pulled out in the sense that they're delaying it. I shouldn't say they're stopping it all together. Um, they couldn't get permits for some things and there were some funding issues. We're still in their docket to get a house, um, but you know Grand Blank and you know Grand Blank High School, our kids didn't wait and neither did the city. Uh, the mayor here in Grand Blank, <coughs> our construction and trades kids, uh, about 300 strong right now, are actually building six little houses and those are actually going to be put in place over by Little Joe's. So you're going to see there's an empty lot over there. And I forget what they call it, but it's going to be, it's going to be a little marketplace over there where businesses can set up and test out their businesses on a small scale. So we are building six for that. Uh, but not the house. That's what that is. Cool. Yes, like a that's pop what that up is. market, I think is the word. What's it called? Pop up, pop -up market. market. Yeah. yeah if you Google called. Port Austin, yeah. there's an example in Port Austin, and you can kind of see what it looks like. They have one downtown there. So, any other questions before I? Okay, yeah. two. Ladies before Joan, go ahead. Yeah, I, I heard comments from uh, other people around town that why doesn't the high school have a home economics class to teach kids how to run the household? A lot of them don't know how to run a household. The budgeting and everything is more than just cooking and cleaning. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we have CTE courses that address that. I don't think they call it home economics anymore. Yeah, it's um, just got a different name. It's now. Got, yeah, but I was going to say, Becky, yeah. we, I, we do offer yeah, that. A couple I still have a tablecloth that dictates yeah. home ed <laughs> when he was in high school a zillion years ago. It was well made. Well, it was just French. <laughs> oh, it was just French. <laughs> But we do have that. If they have questions about that, have us call. It's an option, but not required. Yeah, it's not, a re it's not a required course. It is no, they didn't course. want it as required. We wanted it as an option so that yeah. they could take this class. But they yep. said they don't have any, they don't teach them how to do anything, you know, or how to budget or, or even how to sew. They don't teach them how to sew. Oh, right. Can they teach them how to write? <laughs> Did, uh, Dale, go ahead. Uh, do we have a breakfast program at any of the levels? You mean like uh, feeding breakfast yeah. in the morning for the kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, at all of our levels. Yeah, okay. yeah there is a breakfast program um, for kids to get breakfast in the morning before school. That's at every building. Every building. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question.